Hello, welcome again. Today, we will discuss, has Putin made the biggest mistake of his life by invading Ukraine? Probably, he might well dispose of the Ukrainian military, although that's far from certain. But what happens next? A long, bloody, and expensive occupation, or a puppet regime that collapses as soon as his tanks leave? Then there's the trouble on the home front. Nobody is supposed to criticize Putin. But it's actually hard to find anyone in Russia who will actually praise him right now. In the West, failed politicians retire and enjoy a lucrative retirement on the lecture circuit. But Russia has a winner-takes-all political system, and nobody ever just leaves politics for a quiet life in their dacha. He may have a few problems ahead. I think Putin wants a deal with Ukraine's leadership. Fighting a protracted war would be unpopular in Russia especially since many Russians favor and like Ukrainians. I think Putin would rather make a deal, and Zelensky would rather make some kind of favorable deal if it would spare his citizens from a major onslaught. As a leader, you don't want many of your citizens killed, but you want a face-saving deal. The thing is, for Putin, this is an all-or-nothing gamble. And while his army is likely to win the war, what happens after is extremely uncertain. No matter how justified he feels about Western incursions into Russia's sphere of influence, he isn't going to cower NATO into submission. He has completely lost the soft power war and even in hard power. If NATO gets its act together, they will have more hard power than Russia. Then again, the only thing left for Putin is nukes, and by God, we all know how that may end. It may even start with just a small tactical nuke. You know, to clear out an area. And then it would probably escalate from there. Putin wins in the short term but could lose in the long term here. Vlad is going to win this. He simply has to. If he fails, it's a disaster for him, his leadership, and his nation. He is already taking a beating for his failure to take Kiev on day one, two, or three. So I expect Vlad will keep sending him more and more aircraft, tanks, paratroopers, etc. Now, after Vlad has hoisted the Russian flag over Kiev, the hard part begins. It seems pretty apparent that there will be an asymmetric war coming after the government flees Ukraine. You hit the nail on the head by talking about the occupation. All those civilians being trained in weapons aren't going to the front lines because Ukraine knows they would be cannon fodder. Instead, they are being trained as leave-behinds, similar to the Cold War. There are weapons caches around Ukraine and these people are being trained in how to fit in and hit Russian troops and police when the main fighting stops. They have also said they are going to bring the fight to Moscow. I don't know how true that is. But it's not like Moscow can round up every Ukrainian in the city. As one person says, how can you tell if your plumber is competent? Ask him what city in Ukraine he comes from. I'm curious to see if Putin goes all the way to the Polish border. Things could get very dicey then. I'm going to guess he'll stop short, maybe 20 km. I don't know and that's just an amateur's guess. That is a great image of how far Putin is removed from even the oligarchs that support him. There is no one left who is close enough to him to warn him that he might just be making a mistake. Why would Putin need a long, bloody, expensive occupation? The US needed a long, bloody, expensive occupation in Iraq and Afghanistan because it needed those two places under US control as bases of expansion to pressure other Middle Eastern nations, like Syria and Iran. Putin just needed the next Ukrainian government to not be in league with NATO. So Ukraine stays a buffer zone between Russia and NATO. To this end, he just needs to put another Ukrainian that's pro-Russia or neutral on the seat instead of someone with a bank account in the U.S. As for nobody is supposed to criticize Putin. That's such a British, American way of thinking about things. Basically, you live in a nation that really hasn't gone through that much internal strife. So when sad little babies start yelling, apparently the gravest issues are Putin knows full well he isn't likely going to have a happy ending when he is out of the office. But that has zero to do with Ukraine. Since Yeltsin's time, the oligarchs have been such powerful political forces in Russia that the majority of Putin's attention in the past 20 years has been spent on dealing with them. There have been over a dozen assassination attempts on him. And frankly, there is a very good chance one of these attempts will stick after he leaves the office and no longer has the current level of protection. Western internet posters screaming about how they will criticize Putin are background noise at most. Putin hasn't looked like himself for a couple of years now. I'm wondering if he might have a serious health issue, like an incurable cancer. That could explain such a rash, unputin like move by this invasion of Ukraine. He's always wanted to annex the eastern Donbas region of Ukraine where most of the ethnic Russians live. But to try and invade the whole country and try to overthrow the Ukrainian government is a reckless move not only because of the international sanctions, but also because holding Ukraine would be enormously difficult. The whole Ukrainian population is not going to submit, 
and they're willing to fight an insurgency war. Russia doesn't have the economic strength of the USSR, and they can't maintain their military presence in Ukraine for a long period of time without self-destructing their own economy and trade relations. We should all wish Putin that great Chinese wish. May you live in interesting times. Did Putin make a mistake by going to Ukraine? The world thinks so, and a few people around Putin too. But who is brave enough to call that cat? Or to retire Vlad quickly before their economy tanks? Russian military. They have nearly 100% of the ground forces in Ukraine. They would be vulnerable to any other offensive now. This is a potential disaster. They have had poor logistical support. And you can't put lipstick on this pig. It's been a complete failure. They failed to take Ukraine or cut off its government in 72 hours, which was obviously the first plan. They have failed to secure the air and still don't demonstrate complete air superiority. They have lost, even by the most conservative standards, more people in two weeks than the U.S. did in 20 years in Afghanistan. They may have already suffered a 10% total ground force loss. They have lost enough equipment that they are looking at roughly $8 billion a day to run the war and it's not close to being over. We don't know the long-term economic damage to Russia and its effect on its military. They have convinced just about every European country to rearm, which will cause serious problems with deterrence in the future. They have created, out of whole cloth, a new and potentially deadly Ukraine as a border country, which will obviously never be friendly again. Military manpower will forever be sucked in to guard this. The effects of the military-industrial complex and its ability to perform sales after so much equipment has failed in the field will affect Russian military recovery and future operations. No matter what happens now, this has been a military victory that will be best described as Pyrrhic in the future. I don't see a victory in all this. This war can also be won by Ukraine by inflicting maximum casualties on the invading Russian forces in as short a period as possible. According to Ukrainian sources, about 12,000 Russian soldiers have been killed so far in 15 days of conflict. This is comparable to Soviet losses in Afghanistan and Russian losses in the two Chechen wars. So far, the Kremlin seems comfortable with this level of casualties, but I suspect that its resolve will start to crack as Russian casualties mount to 30, 40 Kelvin soldiers, with an increasing flow of soldiers coming home in wooden coffins. Not even the best spin doctors in the world will be able to maintain the support of the Russian public for this war. Putin will be under immense pressure to deliver a fast, face-saving deal that achieves some of his initial objectives and would probably be acceptable for Ukraine at this stage, something that includes Ukraine's recognition of Crimea as part of Russia and of Donbas and Luhansk as independent republics, as well as a commitment from Ukraine not to join NATO for the next five. 10 years. However, his demands for Ukrainian demilitarization and regime change something that Ukrainians will find unacceptable would now be off the table. This grim but increasingly likely scenario would in fact constitute a Ukrainian victory, as it would result in the defeat of the Kremlin's imperial ambitions and secure Ukrainian independence. The problem for any dictator, going back as far as the Roman Empire, is that holding absolute political power is like riding a tiger it might be easier to get on than it is to get off. Most people attempting it are far more likely to get stuck on the dismount than to stick it. That being said, it is far too early to tell how this will affect Putin. If Ukraine collapses quickly and resistance is minimal, he might even get a boost in popularity over it. If resistance is prolonged, it becomes far more dicey for him. But at this point, none of us knows how it will go. You are assuming that Russia wants to annex the whole of Ukraine with its hostile population rather than just the pro-Russia portions along the border. Unlike the USA, Russia learned from its Afghanistan experience that puppet regimes don't last without popular support. Here are the problems Russia is facing. Assuming he wins. 1. An almost certain insurgency in a hostile country that despises Russia, which NATO will fully fund, train, and equip. 2. 2. It is estimated that it would take roughly 800,000 troops to fully occupy Ukraine. Russia does not have that many. 3. Russia does not have the economy to keep 175,000 men in the field for a long time. 4. Russia is a pariah. And even its few allies, like China, have been warned not to get involved or face sanction themselves. China is not going to sacrifice its economy for Putin. 5. The Russian economy is going to implode from all the sanctions. 6. The other oligarchs are going to get very angry if they feel they are being punished for Putin's war. All their money is abroad, and frozen bank accounts they can no longer access. 7. At home, strong opposition to the war is growing. Civil unrest is also increasing. 8. As he looks increasingly unstable and weak, 
the chances of a coup in Russia increase. There is no strategic or tactical reason for Russian forces to have been so slow to date to take Kiev and other major cities. It's obvious that the Russian military is so decrepit that it simply can't do better. Think about it. In Afghanistan as well as Iraq, the USA absolutely destroyed each country's organized opposition in short order. Yet both occupations still ended up being bloody, costly and ineffective. Here, by contrast, the Russians can't even make much progress against the official Ukraine military. Even if Russia can finally bludgeon the Ukrainian armed forces into submission, how in the world are they going to be able to subjugate 40 million armed to the teeth and fiercely patriotic Ukrainians? Every single Ukrainian knows this. Every hour that goes by with Kyiv free and with the Ukrainian government acting as a cohesive entity is only serving to strengthen Ukrainian and world resolve against a Russian regime that has lost all credibility and moral authority. This will not end well for Putin. His best bet is to swallow up the breakaway states, get some sort of secret promise that Ukraine won't join NATO, declare that his denazification campaign has achieved a resounding success, and bring his troops home for a victory parade, if he can even scrape together a parade in light of the rotting Chinese tires stranding so many of his vehicles.